Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church Wednesday evening Bible study for Wednesday, October 30th, 2024. We are in the book of 2 Kings. We're at the end of chapter 23. We're going to start with verse 36. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. His mother's name was Zebedah, the daughter of Pedidiah. She was from Ruma. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, just as his fathers had done. During Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. But then he changed his mind and rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord sent Babylonian, Aramean, Moabite, and Ammonite raiders against him. He sent them to destroy Judah in accordance with the word the Lord had proclaimed by his servants, the prophets. Surely these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of Manasseh and all he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord was not willing to forgive. As for the other events of Jedekiah's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annuals of the kings of Judah? Jehoiakim rested with his fathers, and Jehoiachin, his son, succeeded him as king. <sighs> Jehoiakim is a fool. Not only is he evil, he's a fool. When in your dad's time, Assyria is the kingdom that you worry about, and the empire that wiped the Assyrians out comes to your land. Okay, becoming a vassal to him makes sense. You can't stand against him. You become a vassal and you stay faithful, right? No. Became a vassal and three years later rebelled. The two most powerful empires in the world at the time combined against him and lost. And unbeknownst to anybody that was there, yeah, your dad helped with that. By It was a narrow victory, and they lost by less than they uh, lost as they came through Judah. Apparently, though, he had decided, no, I'm going to side with Egypt, they're closer. They gave a big army too. And I'm going to use them to be allied to. And they'll come defend me against Babylon. Babylon's got too far to come. He can't handle it. They can't handle it. Egypt's close by and, you know, they have reason to want us here. Except, verse 7, the one I didn't read, the king of Egypt did not march out from his own country again because the king of Babylon had taken all his territory from the wadi of Egypt to the Euphrates River. The Babylonians on the way to Judah had conquered everything that the Egyptians had conquered on the way to Karshemesh. 
and they were getting tribute from and the Babylonians just steamrolled it the Babylonians are putting their empire together in a vacuum there is no powers and that's why Nebuchadnezzar as commander of the army general of the Babylonian army can go in and wipe out the Assyrians decimate the Egyptians and in he goes back to uh, Babylon and when he gets there he found out his father has died so three weeks after he's defeated the Assyrians he becomes king of Babylon and he continues the conquest his grandfather pictured in the vacuum that comes from the absolute collapse of the Assyrians and so in just a few years he runs all the way into to what's now Turkey Anatolia he uh, gets all of Assyria and all of the Assyrian territory that they had had under his control the only people that have any kind of organization to them at that point in time that had come in contact with the Assyrians with the Medes, the Persians, and the Scythians. The Scythians had not been defeated by the Assyrians, but they had faced them. The Medes and Persians had been their uh, vassal, and they allied with Babylon to defeat the Assyrians. He didn't have to defeat them. You know, they're his allies. He's going to give them a special privilege of you won't even be a vassal state. You'll be a free kingdom within the middle of my empire. And that's why three generations later, they're able to rise up and defeat the Babylonians because they know from the center of the empire how corrupt it has become and how weak it's become and they know all of its strengths and ins and outs. Um, they had the idea they were going to make empires. God was setting all the chess pieces up to do this. This is the world history that's going on. And Babylon comes to power first, but they create that vacuum by destroying the Assyrians and destroying the Egyptian army that has just been free from the Ethiopians one generation and when they get back to Egypt Necho finds the Ethiopians attacking him going hey the army seems to be gone let's conquer the land and he has to rouse up an army and defeat the Ethiopians. He barely makes that one. And when he gets that, the Libyans rebel. And he has to go put that down. And um, they eventually become free. Um, he wins the first battle. And the next year, basically, they come free. But in there somewhere... He sends some envoys up to Judah and um, King Nebuchadnezzar has marched through and taken all everything up to the Wadi of Egypt which is uh, uh, basically where the Suez Canal is today. It's the south end of Sinai. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar has marched through Sinai after getting Jehoiakim as a vassal. And for Egypt to say, yeah, I'll ally against you, with you, and you can rebel against 
Babylon. They couldn't defend their own lands. They were barely, barely holding on to their country. They couldn't march out and defeat the Babylonians. The Babylonians have not faced any serious resistance in setting up their empire since the Battle of Karshmash. Oh, sure, they've had to fight battles. They've had to conquer uh, walled cities and that kind of thing. But they've not faced huge armies. They've faced siege situations, and they've gotten really good at sieging walled cities without losing men. And they still have their trade networks, and they now have this vast country that's feeding them food and supplying them with trade goods. And they're making the countries they've conquered more prosperous and they're not wanting to rebel. They're going, we couldn't get a government up and an army up. And, uh, hey, the Babylonians are protecting us. And we're wealthier than we have been for generations. Even the Assyrians that are left are like, hey, it's better to be under the Babylonians than under our own king. And they quit worshiping their war gods. And said, so there our war gods got defeated. <sighs> and Jehoiakim apparently dies in battle. I'll give him that kind of credit. He's at least willing to put his life on the line to defend his rebellion. But the Babylonians are surrounding the city now, sieging it. Verse 8. Jehoiachin uh, yeah, Jehoiachin uh, Chin succeeded Jehoiakim as king. Verse 8, Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Nahashata, daughter of El-Nathan, el uh, however you want to pronounce it. God is the gift. is his uh, Jehoiachin's grandfather's name. Uh, so, anyway. She was from Jerusalem. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord just as his father had done. So, Jehoiachin is 18 when he becomes king, when his dad dies. Um, by the way, his dad was 36 when he died which means Jeho uh, Jehoiakim was 18 when he had Jehoiachin. And essentially, the whole time he's been alive, there's been politics and there's been um, I'll say bad politics and he become, you know, he's watching uh, people be captive, be captured and killed by Nebuchadnezzar. He is of these last few kings of Judah, probably the only one that has any wisdom at all. And he's not real wise, he still didn't worship Yahweh. He still doesn't seek Yahweh's face. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't uh, go back to what Josiah, his grandfather, had done. 
He continues with the practices of Manasseh. Verse 16, At that time the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, advanced on Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And Nebuchadnezzar himself came up to the city while his officers were besieging it. Jehoiachin, king of Judah, his mother, his attendants, his nobles, and all and officers all surrendered to him. The wisest thing any of the Judean kings did when confronted with Babylon. Let's face it, Hezekiah had had the prophecy that his descendants would be captured by the king of Babylon. At that time, Babylon was a newly freed city. Not, a, not even a country, a city. But it had a essentially a mayor that had this idea, we're going to establish an empire. And he set about setting that up, making it a family dynasty thing to do. And he set up the, the trade network and the business network it took to get the money to support an army, not by supporting the army by raids and conquering lands and getting good at getting foodstuffs to feed the army and gold and silver to pay the army but a trade network of business people that could pay taxes to support that army that was his innovation and he succeeded his grandson Nebuchadnezzar conquers um, most of the world Uh, let's face it, uh, the Scythians were his allies that nobody conquered, uh, but the Scythians were north of the Black Sea. Nebuchadnezzar traded with them. So they traded across and around the Black Sea. Uh, into what's now Ukraine and Russia. I mean, the Babylonians knew that area well. They went there. He traded into India, both over land and across water. He traded down into Africa, down south of Ethiopia. He knew from that what the state in Africa was and that Egypt was unable to come to anybody's rescue. In fact, he would come down and conquer Egypt uh, eventually. And um, make Ethiopia his vassal. And Libya, his vassal. Well, he conquered Libya. Um, I mean, he had an empire. Quarter of Africa. Um, all of the Middle East. About a fifth of Asia. Into Europe. And he traded with an area about twice that size outside of his empire and was reasonable allies with most of them. Um, and so Jehoiachin looks at all that, looks at the size of the army he has left, and knows that he doesn't have the experience, he doesn't have the army, he can't do anything. His dad was a fool to rebel. And so he surrenders to Nebuchadnezzar. 
and the first Babylonian captivity happens. He and his officials and, um, well, a bunch of people. But uh, at this point, all I've read is his officials come out and surrender. Um, Let's see. Where, where, where. Verse 16. At that time, uh, well, let's see. No. Okay, middle, I know, middle of verse 12. In the eighth year of the reign of king of Babylon, he took Jehoiachin prisoner. As the Lord had declared, Nebuchadnezzar removed all the treasures from the temple of the Lord and from the royal palace and took away all the gold articles that Solomon, king of Israel, had made for the temple of the Lord. He carried into exile all Jerusalem, all the officers and fighting men, all the craftsmen and artisans, a total of 10,000. Only the poorest people of the land were left. Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiachin captive to Babylon, he also took from Jerusalem to Babylon the king's mother, his wives, his officials, and the leading men of the land. The king of Babylon also deported to Babylon the entire force of 7,000 fighting men, strong and fit for war, and a 1,000 craftsmen and artisans. He made Mataniah, uh, Jehoiachin's uncle, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. And we remember uh, this man as King Zedekiah. And um, so Nebuchadnezzar took 10,000 men. He took the entire army, 7,000 men. Remember I said Josiah had about a quarter million men? Uh, when scripture said that raiding parties were sent against the land and just absolutely wiped it out. Raiding par parties normally were um, basically grab-and-run thieves. And, at least historically. And if you stood up to them, you know, it, they lost. And they didn't get anything. And if they survived that it's because they ran. No. In this case, you march out with the army and you fight them and they were wiping out the Judean army. And then they would steal the goods and go. And take people captive and go. And... The land was just being devastated by those raids. And this, the first siege of Jerusalem did not last long. People didn't get, go hungry in Jerusalem. Jehoiachin recognized that it, it, it wasn't going to go well. He had 7,000 men to defend a city the size of Jerusalem. That was an inadequate force. And he did the reasonable thing. He surrendered. And he went out with all the officials and he surrendered the army. And Nebuchadnezzar took everybody that was anybody that was left captive and took them to Babylon. 10,000 men plus their wives and children. Not a big number. But he left the poorest people of the land. In other words, he took everybody that had wealth. Everybody who had education. Everybody who did anything useful. He expected the land to stay his. 
without any problem. Because he took everybody that should have been able to re lead a rebellion and everybody that would it be take necessary to support that rebellion. And the logic thing is just settle down and be part of the Babylonian Empire. Don't stir up trouble. But God was intent upon destroying Judah and taking them into captivity so that they could sit in captivity and ponder and contemplate why they were there. And Jeremiah was back in the land telling people, this is going to happen, you're evil and you're doing evil things. And Jehoiachin is not coming back home. Zedekiah, verse 18. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. His mother's name was Hamatal, daughter of Jeremiah. She was from Libna. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord just as Jehoiakim had done. It was because of the Lord's anger that all this happened to Jerusalem and Judah, and in the end he thrust them from his presence. And I'm going to, uh, you know, we're going to deal with some things about Zedekiah, but the, most of his reign we're going to deal with next time. Um, he was 21 years old when he became king. Uh, notice his mother's name. I told you last week to remember that name. His older brother was Jehoahaz, who was deposed by Necho, king of Egypt. He was 10 when that happened. He has seen all the politics going on. He knows how ineffective Egypt is going to be. He's seen his king, his nephew, well, his half-brother, rebel, uh, become a vassal to Babylon, and then rebel three years later, and try to get Egypt to help him. And saw his brother die and most of the army die. And his nephew become king. Um, and his nephew is only three years younger than him. They essentially grew up together. They knew each other. He was expected to be an advisor to the king. That's the that's the way the younger uh, uncles and stuff that were royalty, royal family, were expected to be. You you were expected to support the family business. He never expected to be king. And. The king of Babylon picked him because he could do the job, but he should be ineffective at rebellion. He should know better. And he hoped that people would follow him, and he would be able to keep the people uh, controlled. But he was evil just like both of his brothers. He's the third son of Josiah that's king of Judah. There's been two grandsons king of Judah. Both of them lasted a short periods of time.
and God's going to destroy him in his kingdom. It turns out he's ineffective at being king, too. Um, you have to read Jeremiah to understand how ineffective. He vassaled all over the place. He knew that Egypt couldn't help him, and he goes and spends a great deal of money to try to get Egypt to come up and help him in his rebellion, after he rebels. And the king of Egypt takes the money and doesn't send anybody. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, when he gets there and defeats Zedekiah, learns that and takes everybody back to Babylon and then goes and conquers Egypt for that. And that's the precipitating event that causes Nebuchadnezzar to march back and conquer Egypt instead of leave them alone. It was kind of far from him. He had to march a long way. And he does it. And while he's on that campaign... He not only conquers Egypt, he conquers Libya. He defeats Ethiopia, but doesn't conquer it. They become a vassal state for him. Now, they had been a trading partner to Babylon across the water. But instead of welcome him, they decided, no, they wanted Egypt. They misjudged. They were still smarting from losing their empire. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is an amazing general, amazing conqueror. Um, if we hadn't seen Alexander the Great, um, we would think he's the greatest general of all time, the greatest king of all time. Alexander the Great did the same kind of thing, except he didn't do it into a power vacuum. He attacked strong countries, and he did it quicker. Part of it is he learned some of the lessons from Babylon. Part of it was Alexander the Great was ordained by God to do that. And um, if you read Daniel, you understand that God had predicted it. And that um, God was going to do it. He, God is setting up world history here. And he has to have Judah in captivity where they would purify their hearts and worship only him and try to do exactly what Moses told them to do. Now, the problem is they're going to turn inward and they're going to be exclusive and they're not going to try to reach the rest of the world. David understood that he was supposed to win the world over. Solomon interacted with the rest of the world. Uh, Josiah, uh, you know, tried to teach the rest of the world and succeeded with the Samaritans in one sense. They worshipped, they worshipped Yahweh better than Judah did after that. But it's in Babylon that, one thing, the Israelites become Jews. Um, because basically only Judas left. And the Babylonians shortened that to Jew. Or to the word that would eventually become Jew, I should say. Um, 
and they come back as Jews, not Israelites. A shortened form of Judah. And um, Judea had, uh, at this point in time, thought it was the Israelite people. They probably did have a few refugees from the northern kingdom. They probably still pretended they had 12 tribes. But after the Babylonian captivity, uh, there's nobody. In fact, after Hezekiah, apparently, there's only uh, the Levites and Judah. After the Assyrians conquer everything but Jerusalem. And um, Zedekiah was put on the throne because he was incapable of leading people in rebellion. As it turns out, it's a divided society. And there's lots of infighting, and he's an ineffective leader, and he can't even get people to coordinate to defend the city of Jerusalem. He kind of supports Jeremiah, but isn't going to defend him. He kind of goes with the crowd that wants to rebel against Babylon, but he can't lead an army. Um... Even the army is in fighting with itself. And so it goes. And God was going to thrust them from his sight. Holy Father, you are a just God. You punish the unrighteous. And you very often do it in this life. And we see that even today. And we, you know, quote your only begotten son when he said, those that live by the sword die by the sword. Because we we see that those who commit violence very often die of violence. Those who are peaceful can live in peace uh, for a long period of time. And, Lord, um, yet uh, evil still grows in this world. Just like in Zedekiah's time, we seek after that which we want, which is our own way. And as you say, the end result is death. And you are shaping Judah to become the Jews, a people who would be obedient to you and your law, fanatically so, even excluding their own children if they rebelled. So it didn't take hold again. But they would also conclude after hundreds of years of contemplation that the Mosaic Law did not adequately take care of sin and they needed something else. And they were looking forward to the Messiah. And they were looking forward to the Messiah that would conquer the rest of the world and set up a Jewish empire. And you are sending a Messiah that would forgive them of their sin. Thank you for not just making it a Jewish religion, but a religion for the whole world, that I myself could get that forgiveness of sin. I ask that you help me to be able to confront the world with that forgiveness of sin 
that they can become yours. And if they don't, they'll at least know why you condemn them. Lord, we ask that you bless Grace Fellowship Baptist Church, that we would humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked way and do it your way. That we would hold you high, that you could draw them into yourself that we would do the things that you tell us a church should do, including evangelism and discipleship and fellowship and um, service and uh, fellow. Uh, anyway, that we would do them all. That we would grow the kingdom in this spot and you would grow us. Lord, continue to lead us to be that kind of people. In your holy name, amen. I am your host, Frank Reich, Associate Pastor of Family and Ministry at Grace Fellowship Baptist Church, and this has been the Wednesday Evening Bible Study for Wednesday, October 30th, 2024. Um, this was recorded on Saturday, uh, October 26th, 2024. And um, I've had a day in which uh, I got a lot done, but I also had a lot of frustration. And it feels like the whole week. It feels like I almost get things done, and but not quite. Uh, several times this week. Um, didn't complete my week's work and my day's work at, at work and had to leave part of it for the next day. And... That happened Friday and Thursday and Wednesday, you know. And today, I didn't get all the walk done I needed to do. We did make Ruth's uh, memorial service, uh, lovely service. Uh, and um, I meant to get gardening done. I got it done, but didn't have uh, quite enough seeds to plant everything that I tilled. Um so I'm going to have to go buy the seeds and plant them. Uh, but it was getting dark and late, so it was time to water what I'd planted, and I watered it all. And, you know, um, things like that. Come in, and there's problems in the house. This uh, this electrical plants and that electrical plants and this other electrical plants don't work. And some of it doesn't make sense, like here in the bedroom where I'm recording this. The overhead light works. You can see me. <laughs> you, you know it works. Some of the outlets that are on the same circuit don't work. They worked this morning. I don't know. Their refrigerator was off. That, that um, circuit had tripped. Uh, turned it back on and everything's fine. It's the refrigerator's working again. But found out the hot water heater, the electricity's off to it and there's no circuits off. It's on like the bedroom here. It's on a circuit and the things on that circuit are working. It's in the same closet and on the same electrical circuit the air conditioner is on. The air conditioner works. Frankie took a cold shower. I boil water on the stove. And then had to add a lot of tap water. And took kind of a warm uh, wash. Scrubbed off and rinsed off. That sums up my week. Please continue to pray for me. Um, I feel like my body's falling apart. My left hip is hurt off and on. And my left shoulder is hurt left off and on. Like my left half of my body is falling apart. Still, 
God is in charge. God is in control. God is doing things, even if Satan is attacking. And I have confidence God will do great things through Grace Fellowship Baptist Church. But we need to be faithful to him. Y'all have a blessed week. I hope to see you tomorrow morning at church. If not, I hope to see you Wednesday evening. And if nothing else, we'll see you here on YouTube. Have a blessed week.